webinar so people can start logging in. Okay, as people are are signing into our 3 p.m. Eastern session, uh, gun schools and police. Um, I just wanted to make quick mention before I, I forget, uh, this stream today is sponsored by Southern Illinois University Press. Um, so please head over to their website and check out all of the amazing scholarship that they have available there. Um, today we'll be going in order of the program. Um, I would invite any of you in attendance, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please post those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll save all questions for the end. Um, hopefully we'll have enough time to, to get to everybody's, um, everybody's questions. I'm going to ask our panelists to try to stick to 10 minutes. Um, I, will, I will try to remember to jump in at nine minutes to let you know you have a minute left. Uh, I always feel really terrible doing that. <laughs> like I'm throwing you off your, your flow. And uh, so please know that if I do that, it's just uh, out of sake of time. I'm not trying to be disruptive, but I, I guess I sort of am. Um, so with that, nobody came here to listen to me yammer on. Um, we will get started with our first paper, Race Differences in Youth's Attitudes Towards Arming Teachers. Farina, um, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. All right, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Farina Shamsarad. I'm a PhD student at the University of Missouri St. Louis. And like, um, like Andy said, um, the um, title of my project is Race Differences in Youth's Attitudes Towards Army Teachers, Investigating the Role of Procedural Justice. Um, so over the course of the last two um, decades, anxiety over school shootings has um, continued to influence school safety reform and school security in American public schools has now expanded to include the arming of teachers and other school staff in K through 12 schools. However, school violence statistics indicate that the proliferation of school security um, has not grown out of escalations in school violence. And in fact, contrary to public opinion, schools have been and continue to be relatively safe places. For example, not only are school-aged youth um, at a higher risk of violent victimization away from school, but as shown by figure one here, since 1992, less than 3% of youth homicides have occurred at school. However, despite these, um, these statistics, the proliferation of school security measures in, pu uh, in public schools across the nation has been touted by school administrators and politicians as necessary for improving school safety. However, noticeably absent from this discourse has been the opinions of youth who are subjected to the use of these measures. Similarly, despite the fact that students' views about school security contribute to the school climate, youth's perceptions of these practices has been relatively unexplored. In addition, not only is there little evidence in support of the effectiveness of school security practices, but existing evidence points to racial inequalities in the use of and the effects um, of these efforts. For example, there's evidence of racial and ethnic disparities in the implementation and distribution of school security, as well as racial variations in youth's attitudes towards school security and in youth's perceptions of the fairness of the use of these measures. However, the existing literature has not yet identified mechanisms that are leading to these race differences in youth's opinions. I argue that one potential explanation may have to do with differential socialization experiences and in differences in youth's perceptions of the fairness of authority. So therefore, my study um, investigates racial uh, differences in student support and, added, uh, and feelings of safety related to allowing teachers to carry guns at school and the mechanisms that account for these racial differences. Um, and um, I basically am proposing that racial differences in youth's attitudes towards arming teachers um, has to do with differences in youth's perceptions of authority. I argue that due to differential socialization experiences within the school and during interaction with law enforcement, black and white youth will vary in their perceptions of the fairness of institutional authorities, uh, which in turn results in differing attitudes on arming teachers. So figure two here depicts the conceptual model of the hypothesized relationships I'm testing. And um, basically I'm arguing that there's going to be race differences and attitudes towards arming teachers. And that these race differences are going to be mediated by perceptions of police procedural justice, 
teacher fairness and government, uh, government fairness. So um, my study uses data collected as part of the University of Missouri St. Louis Comprehensive School Safety Initiative project. And this project consists of a three year panel design involving two cohorts of students enrolled in 12 middle schools um, across six districts in St. Louis County. And the current study is going to um, use this data from wave three, um, during which most of the students were in the ninth or 10th grade. And due to the study's interest in racial differences, the analyses were limited to um, black and white youth. Um, therefore, out of the 2,753 youth who were surveyed at wave three, 520 respondents who identified being from other racial and ethnic backgrounds uh, were omitted from the analyses. And an additional 239 respondents who were missing data on the dependent variables and the covariates were also removed from the analyses. Um, that leaves the analytic sample to include 1,994 black and white youth, which represent approximately 72% um, of the wave three sample. So um, during wave three, uh, questions tapping students' attitudes towards Army teachers were included in the student, uh, student questionnaire. And to assess the level of support, students were asked, should teachers be allowed to carry guns at school? And the majority of students indicated no. And to assess whether arming teachers would have a positive or negative impact on students' perceptions of safety, students were asked the extent to which um, their feelings of safety might change if teachers in their school, uh, school were allowed to carry guns. Their response categories range from a lot more safe to a lot less safe. And for the analyses, the response categories were reverse coded so that higher values indicate feeling safer. And about um, a little over half of the sample um, indicated that it would feel somewhat or a lot less safe if teachers were armed. So the independent variable is a mutually exclusive binary indicator of race. And a little over half the youth in the analytic sample are white and female, and the average age is 15. The mediators are mean score scales, capturing perceptions of police procedural justice, teacher fairness, and government fairness. And there were also several variables included in the models to control for factors related to race and perceptions of safety and per, uh, perceptions of fairness. So to assess, uh, to assess the extent to which procedural justice and fairness attitudes mediate the effect of race on arming teachers attitudes, I estimated uh, path models using generalized structural equation modeling. Um, this approach is appropriate because it allows for the simultaneous estimation of direct and indirect paths between the independent variable, the mediators, and the outcomes. The indirect effects were estimated using the product of coefficient methods with Stata's NLCOM command. And because this command um, calculates standard errors that assume a normal distribution, uh, bootstrap standard errors were estimated across a thousand replications uh, with bias corrected uh, confidence intervals. So figure three here presents the unstandardized coefficients for the significant direct effects of race and the mediators on both dependent variables while controlling for the full set of um, indicators. And the dotted lines here indicate non-significant paths. So the results show that race is significantly and negatively associated with support for arming teachers, suggesting that the odds of black youth supporting arming teachers is 36% lower re relative to white youth. Additionally, as is expected, race is significantly and negatively associated with um, the three mediators, uh, which indicate that relative to white youth, black youth reported significantly lower perceptions of police procedural justice, um, teacher fairness, and government fairness. Secondly, the results suggest that higher perceptions of police procedural justice and government fairness increase the likelihood of supporting army teachers, uh, whereas the effect of teacher fairness was non-significant. And moving on to the second dependent variable, uh, results from bivariate analyses in the form of chi-square tests, which I did not present here, show that the relationship between race and change in feelings of safety was significant, uh, which suggests that compared to white youth, black youth um, feel less safe if their teachers were armed. However, the direct effect of race um, on feelings of safety is non-significant in the GSEM model, which indicate that the covariates um, included in the models fully accounted for racial differences and feelings of safety related to arming teachers. And additionally, we see that youth who report higher perceptions of government fairness have a higher um, odds of reporting that they would feel safer if their teachers were armed. And in contrast, students who have higher perceptions of teacher fairness are less likely to feel safe if their teachers were armed. 
So table one here presents the um, specific indirect effects of race via perceptions of fairness. And the results show that race had an indirect significant effect on both the dependent variables through perceptions of government fairness. So essentially these results in, uh, suggest that black youth tend to hold more negative attitudes toward the government, which then translates um, into them being less supportive of arming teachers and anticipating feeling less safe if their teachers were armed. So overall, um, the results indicate that there are significant racial differences in St. Louis County students' attitudes on arming teachers and in their perceptions of the fairness of institutional authorities. Um, these uh, racial differences um, uncovered in the study suggest that the effect of school security measures may differentially impact youth of uh, varied racial backgrounds. The results also indicate that the use of target hardening measures such as arming teachers can be especially detrimental for minority students in terms of their educational experiences and outcomes. Secondly, uh, the study offers insight into the mechanisms that may explain variation in students' perceptions of school security. And the mediating effect found here suggests that perceptions of fairness may be a promising avenue for future research. Lastly, findings from this study suggest that school administrators should consider the unintended negative consequences that arming teachers may have on their students. Effective policy initiatives must be theoretically driven, um, empirically supportive, and forward-looking. Although school shooting incidents can have a profound and lasting impact on the school and broader community, they are statistically rare events. Therefore, school administrators should consider programs that proactively address the precursors to school violence, rather than implementing policies that may negatively impact their students on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next uh, paper is uh, the effectiveness of law enforcement scoop and run practice on survival from firearm injury. Um, Lars, whenever you're ready. All right, are you see my front screen there? Yes, we do. Awesome. Uh, thanks all, my name is Lars Almquist. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington in the School of Public Health. Uh, my presentation today is on the effectiveness of law enforcement scoop and run practice on survival from firearm injury. And it's uh, work I was doing for, I've been doing for a scoping review uh, project. And so I don't have any financial or other disclosures to, or conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, however, I do acknowledge that I approach and present my research through particular intersectional lenses of my own identity and experience, um, and those elicit maybe biases, both known and unknown, um, and that, that I would be happy to talk about any of those uh, if anything arises uh, during this presentation. I'd also like to note, uh, in full disclosure, that this research was conducted in February or March, which was both pre-COVID and pre the mainstreaming of calls to defund or ab abolish the police uh, that we've seen in 2020. Um, so I've elected to continue to present this research, but also this could be framed as a, a particular reform effort as we, we seek to uh, reimagine or, or transform what law enforcement could look like uh, in particular communities. Uh, so the overview what I'd like to talk about today is essentially the problem, which is uh, fatalities from penetrating firearm trauma uh, to present a potential solution, which is the use of law enforcement scoop and run practices. And I'll walk through the purpose of the scoping review, the methods and procedures, some results, and a summary and present some future directions. As we're all aware, let's start with the problem. Um, firearms account for nearly 40,000 deaths and more than 100,000 non-fatal injuries annually in the United States. Uh, as of yesterday, that totals up to 38,000 deaths. Um, and so we are possibly well approached to uh, pass that number in 2020, despite lockout orders, social distancing, et cetera, that this is not a problem that's going away anytime soon. In fact, it's possibly uh, increasing during these times. Uh, in the vast majority of non-suicide cases, in other words, gun violence or gun violence perpetrated between two or more individuals, uh, emergency medical services, also known as EMS personnel, uh, are responsible for providing pre-hospital treatment and transportation of gunshot victims to nearby emergency departments or trauma centers. Uh, however, in municipalities with high pre-hospital fatality rates from firearm injury, uh, have begun using uh, been begun authorizing non-EMS first responders, namely law enforcement and police officers, uh, to transport trauma victims to nearby trauma centers. 
a forerunner in this is the city of Philadelphia um, that's been you know, authorizing the, the use of law enforcement scoop and run practices for a number of years now. Um, from, from the years 2005 to 2016, an average of 30% of all patients with penetrating injuries in Philadelphia were transported by police, uh, not EMS. Uh, by 2016, the proportion had exceeded 50%. Uh, and even this was even in the context of a relatively stable incidence of penetrating injuries across the city during the past decade. Uh, so essentially a constant, you know, number of uh, injuries or proportion of injuries, uh, but the share of individuals driven or taken to a trauma center by law enforcement increased substantially. Uh, so some of this, you know, results that even as early as 1991, we knew that police were reportedly present at calls uh, that were activated by emergency medical services, uh, as low as 24% of the time and upwards of two thirds of the time. Uh, and the majority of these were trauma related, uh, that police are likely and often first responders and on the scene first, uh, but have only recently been deployed in terms of getting uh, per, uh, injured, in, injured individuals to trauma centers uh, in a systematic fashion. So some of the general definitions that we're working with here, uh, the, the phrase scoop and run is used, and that involves uh, minimal resuscitation at the scene uh, with the goal to get the patient to a trauma center or emergency department uh, as quickly as possible, as, a, as opposed to on-seat treatment, resuscitation, and transfer following some degree of stabilization uh, that's you know, characteristic of the stay in play response. Uh, the former scoop and run is basically providing what's called uh, BLS or basic life support, where stay in play or the EMS response is considered advanced life support. And some of the characteristics of these uh, you can see uh, here from Stratton and all published uh, a number of years ago, that the scoop and run basically involves an intuitive assessment by law enforcement, uh, an attempt to stop immediate uh, you know, bleeding or hemorrhaging, and then essentially the rapid transport to emergency department or trauma center. Uh, the benefit of this is that you know law enforcement and cops have state authority. They have sirens. They have the ability to, you know, weave in and out of traffic and get there where uh, you know a civilian or someone else wouldn't, um, and have folks get out of the way, which can significantly minimize time uh, between an injury uh, and getting a patient to a trauma center. You know, in contrast, EMS has uh, much more significant um, expertise available, um, but there are a, a number of steps that EMS go to in terms of stabilizing an individual before they get onto an ambulance and on their way to a trauma center. Um, and so, you know, essentially the obvious trade-off is time versus treatment or expediency versus expertise. And the question is, you know, which one works better or to what degree do, do law enforcement scoop and run practices actually meet or exceed uh, EMS uh, transport practices. There's been a lot of literature on advanced versus basic life support techniques among EMS and first responder uh, literature, but very few have come through um, you know, engaging law enforcement or scoop and run tactics. And so the, the premise of the scoping review, I wanted to look at a primary outcome of essentially survival or mortality to frame it otherwise. Uh, and then secondary outcomes of you know, pre-hospital time from injury to arrival. Uh, I wanted to look at spillover patient complications. For example, if you know you had uh, injury to a particular organ, but you were bleeding out, and that caused failure to other organs, um, to what degree you know would that time and you know the pre-hospital time actually affect spillover to other organ failure? That if you could get there a few minutes earlier, could you actually prevent um, you know ongoing crises within the patient in the trauma center that might lead to the death uh, of that patient that might not be directly related to that first injury, uh, but could have been spillovers from it. And third, the cost of care, uh, because let's be honest, policymakers respond to incentives, uh, and if saving lives isn't enough, saving money, unfortunately, often is. Um, I used uh, a number of data sources from PubMed through Google Scholar, and, and walked through the, uh, you know, Prisma, you know, preferred reporting items for systematic and reviews and meta-analysis, the extension they use for scoping reviews. I uh, reviewed uh, 2,044 titles. Um, of these, 171 specifically pertain to pre-hospital scoop and run engagement of trauma. Uh, I reviewed all 771 aspect, a, abstracts and the remaining 35 articles that involved law enforcement underwent a full text review for eligibility. Um, of these, five studies highlighted the scoop and run activities of non-EMS law enforcement first responders and were included into the final review. Uh, so some characteristics of the included studies, um, one is that they were only five, um, that all five had been conducted within the last six years since 2014. All five were also retrospective cohort studies uh, using trauma center data. Uh, and critically, all five law enforcement scoop and run uh, papers, you know, 
indicated that law enforcement scoop and run is either you know at worst neutral or at best is actually a protective factor compared to traditional EMS stay and play responses. Of the three studies that had statistically significant findings uh, with the likelihood of scoop and run patients, uh, arrival to a trauma center via scoop and run was associated with higher odds of survival by as low as 20%, but upwards of 80% uh, compared to EMS transport. Um, and so a major hypothesis behind this has to do with uh, the secondary you know, variable of interest, which was pre-hospital time. Uh, in, in surgery or in the, the trauma surgery world, there's a concept of the golden hour. It's the, the first 60 minute window between experience of trauma and arrival at a trauma center. Um, has long re represented the acceptable kind of pre-hospital window from when you wanna get a patient from trauma to the to uh, you know, be, be seen by a surgeon. Um, there's been a shift in recent years to go from the golden hour to what they call the platinum half hour, um, that for certain trauma, especially uh, violent penetrating trauma, you know, especially as um, calibers of firearms, et cetera, become greater, uh, that an hour may not be enough, that you actually may have to get a patient there within a half hour to have significantly, um, you know, more likely odds of, of survival for that patient. Um, only one paper, only the NASA paper actually engaged pre-hospital time, uh, which was quite surprising to me. Um, but they did note that for every single minute increase between an emergency call and on-scene arrival to the patient is associated with a 2% with a relative increase in the odds of mortality. And that every additional minute spent on scene is associated with a 1% relative increase in mortality odds. And so you can imagine that, you know, the time it takes for an ambulance to get to a patient and the time it takes to stabilize a patient and get the, you know, the, the small percentages, one and 2% per minute, uh, start adding up, um, you, know, you know, against the likelihood that an individual will survive uh, versus, you know, having a, you know, an officer or a law enforcement official who may already be in the community or on patrol, uh, basically throw someone in the back of a car and race to the nearest trauma center. Uh, that, you know, even single minutes actually start adding up in terms of the likelihood that an individual will survive. Um, let me back up real quick. Uh, none of the studies engage spillover effects and none engage the cost of care, things that I think we, we would really be uh, welcome to, to look at in future studies as we evaluate this. A number of issues and limitations uh, came across. One was the, the fundamental lack of data uh, and the limited evidence base. I mean, I guess that's part of the scoping review is to find out um, you know, what the evidence base looks like. And it looks like we can we have a huge opportunity to work here. Uh, in the literature, there's still a contentious debate regarding scoop and run versus stay and play, even among EMS responders before you even involve law enforcement. Uh, challenges, there's no formal protocols yet regarding police delivered care where there are for EMS responders. Um, and so often victims are rendered no care at all. It's literally up to the intuition of that law enforcement officer at the time. Um, there is an, uh, there's a chance that, you know, in a race to scoop and run, a, an individual may be transported to a suboptimal or unequipped facility, maybe a facility that's further away from, than the actual nearest trauma center if the law enforcement officer does not know uh, the exact spot where they're taking someone. And then there's the ethics of letting the perpetrator go free. If you grab the victim of the gunshot, you know, wound and take them to a trauma center, are you inherently letting the, the victim get away a bit easier? And finally, for some future directions, um, you know, both broad and municipality specific assessments of EMS versus law enforcement pre-hospital timetables uh, regarding the platinum half hour framework are really warranted um, to see, you know, to what degree these might be effective at, at shifting, uh, you know, mortality rates lower as we, we, you know, work to get towards the platinum half hour, which may necessitate more creative uh, interventions uh, on the ground. And there's certainly an opportunity for trauma-focused public health and public safety partnerships as we talk about shifting law enforcement away from, uh, you know, punitive entities to protecting entities. Uh, we have a critical moment to leverage our existing infrastructure and to transform law enforcement to legitimately serve and protect uh, as we seek to enhance public safety, um, you know, rather than militarize some of our communities more. Um, that's if and as long as we're going to have law enforcement in its, this, a semblance of its current form. Uh, obviously, those are active questions going on right now. Um, there are a number of references and works consulted I'd be happy to share with you um, if you're interested. Um, feel free to contact me uh, by email or at almquist underscore Lars on Twitter. Uh, and thanks so much for having me today. All right. Thank you, Lars. Um, our next paper, uh, Angelo Brown. Um, Angelo, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right, thank you all for coming today. My presentation is gonna to be on the impact 
um, of the United Nations Police Deployments. This was a qualitative study that included uh, 40 officers from 20 different nations from North and South America, Asia, Africa, Europe, and Oceania. Um, it was a diverse sample of female and male officers. About a quarter of the officers were female, which represents uh, more than the UN um, has. Uh, the purpose was to explore um, their careers, trajectory um, after deployment, relationships they built in the mission and after the mission, uh, policing skills they learned, financial issues, and their health. So for the pre-deployment period, there was various positive and negative aspects um, officers discussed during the interviews. The first was the induction training. This is a, a mandatory training that all the officers receive when they first arrive at the mission. For those that only had this mission, it was very um, you know, uh, useful for them. And they said it was a great value to prepare them uh, for what they needed to do in the mission. Um, but those that had a national training, uh, many uh, countries um, gave their officers their own training before this. Um, they found this national training was much more expansive than the UN's induction training um, and made it the induction training actually repetitive. Uh, despite this, um, most of the issue, most of the officers found that the issues discussed in either trainings um, help them address their job. Um, but the, the main learning and the training they received was on the job. Um, the next important thing that officers talked about was uh, motivations to go to the mission. These greatly vary depending on if an officer came from a developed nation or a developing nation. Um, for those that came from the wealthier nations, they often wanted an experience, a challenge, and just to learn about different cultures. While well, those from uh, less, lesser developed nations or developing nations found, you know, their main motivation was actually to earn money, um, improve their financial status. Um, Bobby, an officer from a developing nation from the Middle East, uh, represented this motivation to make money. Um, when you deploy, he said to the United Nations, they provide you with two salaries, one you get from the UN and one from the homeland. So that's the main reason. In my country, the police duties is very hard work, really hard conditions, um, he, he stated. Um, it, the United Nations mission is an escape. Work, uh, working times are very strict, so you really enjoy the time when you're doing the mission. Um, this was a common theme from these officers from you know, these developing nations to um, escape their, their home environment and um, go on to a mission. Um, for most officers that were they were very excited to go on a mission, but this, this was not all officers. Some officers felt very stressed and anxious to go to a mission. Um, one a good example was from a male officer from Eastern Europe um, who expressed uh, he was very stressed out before the mission. Because um, once he found out the mission was going to, it was a war-torn mission in West Africa. As he says, I was almost crying because this was seen as the worst possible option, according to my colleagues. Uh, his motivation was to make more money and get into the easiest, safest mission possible. So a common theme that came from the officers, um, they discussed that those who looked into joining a mission due to just financial reasons were often not very invested or effective in the mission as they wanted to um, extend the mission as long as possible um, so they can continue earning the UN salary. Um, so for the deployment, um, the officers commented, um, you know, more on the positive side of things. This outweigh, outweighed any negative comments. Uh, for the vast majority of officers that I interviewed, they found that they were making uh, purposeful impacts in the um, host nation, such as creating a safer environment and helping improve the local police and making um, good connections with the locals. Uh, most officers really enjoyed working and learning um, new skills from their international colleagues. For those who did not mention learning new skills, they usually mentioned that they uh, learned uh, more about other cultures. Um, an example came from an officer from South America. 
He said he didn't know much about Islam other than its relation to 9-11. When he went to the mission, he learned from his Muslim colleagues um, their um, culture, and he found that they were the friendliest and kindest officers he knew. So it really changed his um, you know, mindset and um, his stereotypes. Um, another issue was officers' health. This was affected in various ways during the mission. Um, the positive side of this, a lot of officers had more time and ability to work out, they ate healthier, and the environment made them feel better. Uh, one example was a female officer from Eastern Europe. Uh, she explained, in South Sudan, the ecology is better than in, um, than in my home country. No asphalt, no factories, much less cars. All the fruits and vegetables were grown without chemicals and so on. I even would like to state that I felt much better. Uh, I was more comfortable during the heat and happy there was no negative 20 degree weather. Um, another thing I want to discuss was religion. It played an important role in many of the officers' uh, deployments. They claimed that religion helped them cope and build relationships with other UN officers and with locals that had the same religion. Religion also made some officers feel divided as there was a mix of mostly Christian and Muslim officers and due to religious and cultural norms, sometimes they would divide themselves into subgroups, especially during prayer time and during meals and holidays. Uh, some officers, especially those from developed countries expressed how the bureaucracy of the UN often gone the way of progress and the UN uh, overworked them seven days a week. Despite this, many officers did acknowledge they were still making important impacts on the local population. Officers also had various risks in these missions um, that they didn't have at home, especially for those from developed nations, um, from diseases to attacks from rebel groups. As one officer explained, he faced animosity by um, the Sudanese Africans. I'm an Arabic man. So they told me, you're Arabic man. You're coming to arrest us in our own country. After being released, we will shoot you. Many officers were treated good or poorly depending on their ethnicity, gender, religion, and their nation's political and historical context. Other officers that had issues like this were um, when the French officers were told to leave the country as they had previously colonized the host nation and the locals did not want them there. Um, more common of a problem officers expressed was when locals and government officials of some host, na host nations did not want to take orders from female officers. Some UN officers also had never worked with the female officers, so it took them a while to get used to this new um, um, part of their uh, career and job. Uh, the last part of the study looked at the post-deployment phase of officers integrating back into their home nation. Many officers shared their ideas um, that Stephen, a Northern European officer expressed, which was policy should be revised in the direction to help officers easy, easier to reintegrate into their home police force, of practically punishing officers coming back from deployment by placing them at lower positions. Police management often found deployments to be well-paid vacations and an abandonment to their home country. This led to a roadblock to promotions and even led to various officers leaving policing um, to find another job or applied to early retirement. Uh, for many officers, there were significant social disruptions in their life. Losing friends and even various divorces were mentioned. The divorce, the divorce all came from officers from developed nations as experienced by John. It turns out that one of my best friends back home started seeing my wife and thus my marriage ended in a very nasty way. The relationship with my daughter was totally destroyed. Um, by my wife's environment during and after my divorce. This was my biggest regret to the mission. Um, another officer um, was one of um, many that had some type of psychological effects from the mission. Angelo, about one minute left. Uh, as she would discuss her nightmares, she would see a gun, a guy with a gun come to her home. Uh, sleep disturbance was one of the more common issues people um, developed when they returned back home. Um, there was many other health effects um, from the mission, um, but many of them um, got better over time. Um, loss of weight was also a significant issue. Some saw this as a positive and some saw it as, as a negative. Um, as some was it from healthy food, some of it was from depression. Um, the officers also had issues with um, their young children. Um, 
really missing them and being stressed out as they were gone for long missions. The various positive sides was especially financial wealth. No matter what country they came from, they improved their financial position, learning new skills and learning new cultures and better ways to um, you know, deal uh, with different cultures when they got back home as we live in a new global society for many of these um, countries. Um, officers mentioned various policy recommendations such as um, maintaining institutional memory and leaving um, officers in the missions for longer, as well as um, helping uh, peacekeepers uh, reintegrate back in their, their home country without losing their job or um, losing their promotions. So um, thank you all very much for this present, um, coming to this presentation. Thank you so much for that, Angelo. Um, so we are supposed to have um, four papers in this panel. I just want to confirm that the, or whether or not any, either of the authors of, is it safer to have guns on campus? If you're in, in the webinar and haven't been promoted to panelist, um, can you message me just to make sure? I don't want to, to overlook anybody who is supposed to be here. Um, okay. Um, all right, I just wanted to make sure. So. Uh, we have time then um, for questions for any of our any of our panelists um, today. Um, congratulations and thank you, um, everybody, on um, doing some really amazing work. Um, if anybody in attendance has any questions for any of our presenters, please feel free to post those in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and panelists, if you have any questions for each other, um, you can just unmute yourselves and chime in. I had a question um, for the um, um, Ferena. Sorry, I, I missed saying your name, but um, I was really interested in how um, how did um, educational um, attainment of parents and financial um, situations um, interact with um, the children's views on um, arming in the schools? Yeah, that would have been really um, interesting to see, but unfortunately, I didn't really have um, those measures um, about their parents to be able to, or even just um, like income level or anything like that. Um, and I also know it would have been interesting to see like how political views maybe would have um, affected their views on arming teachers, but I also, the student questionnaire didn't have um, those measures, so I was unable to see, but yeah, really good question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Here we go. Um, so a question for you, Lars, uh, from Sarah Daly. So Sarah asks, can you talk about rural and urban differences and how the influence of distance to the hospital, uh, how do you think um, that affects what we consider, how we consider homicide rates? Sarah, I hope I, I got that right. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, the the rural urban divide is is definitely engaged in the literature, particularly around the EMS response. It's almost it's almost taken as a given in the kind of law enforcement or scoop and run literature that those are taking place in larger urban centers that have access to a level one trauma center. Um, and so, you know, the cases of Philadelphia, et cetera, you know, have four or five in the same city, <clears throat> and so it's a matter of like almost which trauma center do you take someone to if you get to them in time? Uh, unfortunately, yeah, the huge gap is what do you do in rural areas that either don't have like the coverage or penetration, no, no pun intended, of uh, trauma centers or EMS professionals, et cetera. Um, and we really don't know. I think there's a lot of folks that are kind of, that's that's part of the debate is, you know, when would you rather send a, a team of professional, you know, paramedics out or just have someone rip someone to the, the, the closest place they think they can get them to. Um, so yeah, there's a clear urban bias, uh, clear bias towards proximity to a trauma center. And, you know, obviously I think that <clears throat> would dovetail with, you know, those places also having larger EMS fleets, larger law enforcement, you know, capacity, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely an issue. I'd love to, to chat further and I can kind of go back and dig into some of the research I did where that popped up, but it, 
there is clearly a uh, an urban bias, and so I'm not sure the, to what degree that would impact homicide rates or how we interpret those. Um, but yeah, fantastic question. That's a, a huge disparity that uh, unfortunately will likely to continue to exist, um, you know, at least given our, our current circumstances. Um, a follow-up question for you, Lars. I, I think a question for you. Um, Bethany Hill writes on arming on the arming of teachers. It'd be interesting to see the split on rural versus urban views as well. So I, I, I think that's kind of a prompt for you to to share with us what you what you might know about that or speculate on what you think those views might be. On um, on me as arming teachers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like the urban rural um, uh, divide, um, in uh, support for that. Gotcha. Well, as as Lars, who did not present on that, I don't think we should arm teachers, but that's... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm... No, 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 that's totally fine. So I'm, that's I'm, my personal bias. I don't think we should arm teachers at all, but uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I can pump that over to Farina if she wants to, to jump yeah, in on My bad, I yeah. am super tired. <laughs> um, no, for sure, that would be an interesting um, thing to see, but... Um, the thing with St. Louis is, I don't know if a lot of people are familiar, um, it's it's very like racially divided. So um, a lot of the schools that we, um, the schools that we served the kids in, um, they were split between what's called North and South County. So traditionally like South County schools, they're like the majority are going to be like white students. Um, and then in North County, the majority uh, are black students. Um, so because the way like St. Louis is divided, um, I, I mean, I, I feel like it would be interesting to see, but I feel like you would see the same differences as you did with race just because um, it's so segregated here. But um, th that's, yeah, that's definitely something that, that will be interesting to look at. So thank you. Thank you for that. And sorry again for the, uh, the mix up on my part. Totally fine. <laughs> um, here we go. Uh, so this one uh, is for you, Lars. <laughs> um, Derry, can you re repeat about the 30,000 deaths? Are those from police shootings? Um, are those, is that statistic just for the United States? Um, this is coming from a criminology student in Spain. Uh, thank you there. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of uh, police shootings in this country, but thankfully they're not as many as that. So uh, police shootings, uh, police ho homicides at the hand of police uh, averaged between 1,000 and 12 to 1,300. So I think this year we're up to uh, about 1,200 in 2020 <clears throat> uh, deaths at the hands of police um, uh, via firearm per se versus, you know, taser or, you know, other uh, other methods. Um, we average about 40,000 deaths due to uh, firearms in this country. Um, the majority of those, you know, between 60% and, and two thirds are actually from suicide. And so suicide by, by aggregate numbers is a, is a bigger numerical problem in this country uh, when it comes to firearms than homicides. Uh, though we do have uh, roughly 15,000 homicides with firearms every single year in this country. And that's been pretty standard. Uh, a great resource for that, that I was presenting in one of those slides, if you, you can go to uh, the gun violence archive. Um, is one of a number of uh, data repositories and they essentially update uh, almost in real time within every like 24 to 72 hours, uh, the number of uh, the number location uh, and characteristics regarding each uh, either injury or uh, death involving a firearm in the United States. They have about uh, 7,500 different sources they pull from. Uh, and so literally the, the map that I showed was updated as of yesterday. Uh, those numbers I share was like as of yesterday. They are they do some fantastic work, and, and that'll give you a you know an unfortunate uh, glimpse into what we're looking at. But thankfully, not thirty thousand police deaths. Uh, that's only roughly uh, twelve hundred in this country. Yeah, and we we should also say too for for those in the audience who might not be familiar with the data collection in the U.S. that um, like our statistics on on. Uh, police involved um, homicides are are all unofficial, right? Like because we know that the Uniform Crime Report um, does not have like an accurate reflection of these. We know uh, of lots of cases um, where reporting departments have uh, reclassified or just like flat out just not included um, homicides that officers are involved in. And so data collection on this issue is coming from like independent sources. So um, getting at, at the actual number here is, I, I think, a lot trickier than it probably should be. 
Um, uh, a question for Angelo that just came in through the chat. Um, Marcus English is asking, um, how did you find your participants? Oh, yes, I reached out to the police advisor to the UN and they gave me um, a pretty large sample, um, about 25 officers per mission. And then from there, I um, reached out to each one and um, interviewed them you know, during the mission and then interviewed them after the mission was complete. Um, I wasn't able to get all of them completed. Some of them have long missions. Um, they were still on the mission, so I wasn't able to do that uh, post interview with them yet. And then from there, I snowballed sampled um, their connections um, as well. So I'm, I'm still doing more interviews of the um, post deployments at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, is coming for you, Lars. Um, we're wondering if you can speak to men, particularly black men who are under criminal supervision, who have been injured due to gun violence and issues with the police bringing them to the hospital. Hmm. So the, the main issue that pops up um, is kind of the, the ethical limitation that I, I mentioned toward the end is that, you know, uh, are you letting the perpetrator go free? Like do, does taking law enforcement resources and directing them to one thing, you know, pull them away from something that, uh, you know, as of now uh, that we say like they, that shouldn't be in their scope of work. And so, um, you know, hopefully the, the, the mission and the, the, uh, the impetus to protect and serve and then on the trauma end to do no harm uh, means that you don't check criminal history before you throw someone in a car and try to get them to a trauma center. Uh, so in an ideal world, um, you know, you wouldn't find that out until much later and ideally until the, the patient has survived enough to find out their criminal background. Um, I can go dig back into the literature if you want to shoot me an email or connect with me. I'd love to, to chat with you on that. Um, certainly of the folks who are engaged in law enforcement scoop and run, the, the majority are black and the majority are male. Um, the articles that I engaged, I've, to my knowledge, didn't engage uh, criminal history of those individuals, but there is a there is a conversation in the literature about kind of ethical considerations in using existing law enforcement resources for um, basically processes like this. Great, thanks a lot for that. Um, so I'm going to uh, wrap this up. Thank you again to all of our panelists. Thanks um, for everybody who came out today. Um, I hope CrimCon has been a good time for you. Um, hey, if you're sticking around for the four o'clock panel on the stream, I have to um, reset this webinar just for recording purposes. Um, also uh, mentioned again, I don't remember if I did so at the top, uh, stream two today is sponsored by Southern Illinois, Southern Illinois University Press. My ability to speak is <laughs> diminishing as the day goes on. Um, thanks again, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out for CrimCon. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.